Well, thank you for joining me. I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about something that has been uh, a keen interest of mine for over a decade. And that's the topic of meteors and meteorites, what we commonly think of as falling stars. I've been very excited to learn about the science behind them and to go visit meteorite crater sites and sit out under the stars at night looking for shooting stars. And sometimes even see the actual meteorites to be able to hold them in my hand. And during all the years I became interested in learning about the science behind them, I also became interested in learning about cultural views of meteors. How do different groups of people around the world perceive them? What do they mean? Uh, how do indigenous cultures in Australia and around the world understand them? And how are they incorporated into their knowledge systems? It's been a difficult journey for me as a scientist and a non-indigenous person because I'm not an expert in anything indigenous. Um, and there's very limited amount that I think I can really know or understand. But I'm still excited to learn about this. And I've been very privileged for the last 10 years to be able to work closely by invitation with some elders around Australia, especially in the Torres Strait, where they've taught me a little bit about how they understand meteors and meteoritic phenomena. And that's really what I'd like to talk about during this presentation. It's really important that we understand that those of us working in science, in Western science, non-Indigenous people, Indigenous knowledge doesn't need to be validated by Western science. It's not there to be validated by Western science. Um, it's already valid in its own right. There are going to be areas where the Indigenous knowledge and the Western science meld in perfectly. There are going to be areas where it doesn't meld in perfectly. And there are going to be areas where they might almost seem in conflict. So what? It's about having two different systems of knowledge that try to understand the world in quite different ways, and each have their benefits. Yes, yeah, so I'm Tyson Yunker Porter. Um, yeah, I belong to Upledge Clan I'm on Western Cape York. I have um, previous older affiliations in South Australia and um, uh, into the southeast. Uh, I work as a senior lecturer in Indigenous knowledge at um, Deakin University. And yeah, father, uncle, grandfather, cousin, brother, everything. Uh, all of these roles, you know, that we fulfill, you know, that they're sitting in a in a universe, a, a dynamic universe that's um, is dynamic because of the diversity of it. So you know, when you um, when you're looking at the reflection of the moon on the ocean at night, you know, you're seeing from that subjective standpoint, you know, you're seeing that reflection right there, um, but that's not where it is, you know, because as you're moving along that beach, you see that that's moving as well. And so you've got to understand that from all the eyes looking, you know, it's uh, seeing those, that, that moon reflection in a different place. And, you know, uh, we have stories about, you know, people who've tried to zero in on that one truth and that, that one perspective and to chase that thing. And, you know, <laughs> you chase that singular vision of what that reflection is, but it's always going to move away and lure you somewhere where you don't want to go. Um, and that's where you get that interaction between Earth Camp and Sky Camp because pe people, people are taken up, they're abducted, or they're inviting that thing to come down. What are falling stars? What are some of the science behind it? I think it's important to understand some of the science behind it and then understand the cultural perspectives behind it and find ways those two worlds meet together. It's in that intersection that we can find new innovation and new ways of working together. Now, we commonly think of them as falling stars or shooting stars. From a scientific perspective, it's a misnomer. They're not actually stars. They're just bits of debris in space. But let's talk a little bit about the terminology. What does it really mean? What's the difference between them? Really giant chunks of rock in space are called asteroids. They're generally about 10 meters or bigger in size, from 10 meters to even a couple of hundred kilometers in size. Some of the biggest ones in our solar system are asteroids like Ceres and Vesta. They're actually called dwarf planets now, but these are giant chunks of rock in space. If it's really far out and it's made of sort of dust and ice, we call it a comet. And as it comes close to the sun, the heat from the sun actually vaporizes the ice and burns off into space. We can see these beautiful tails. If it's smaller than 10 meters and it's in outer space, we call it a meteoroid. Most meteoroids are the size of a grain of sand or, or less than that. They travel through space at very high velocities, anywhere from 
15 to 20, 25 kilometers a second. That's how fast they're going. When they come into the atmosphere, they start to burn up. They burn up by something called ram pressure. They're traveling at these tremendous speeds and coming into the Earth's thick atmosphere, and it creates pressure. And this pressure creates heat and causes them to burn up. When they burn up, we see a flash of light across the sky like we can see in our image. This is called a meteor. Most meteors burn up in the atmosphere. If they're really big, like maybe the size of a big chunk of rock or maybe the size of a small car, they'll create these gigantic fireballs. Huge, bright, even break up, create these fragments that go across the sky. If they hit the ground, we call them a meteorite. So it's a meteoroid in space, a meteor in the atmosphere, and a meteorite when it hits the ground. Sometimes the meteorites are small, they just hit the ground, make a little hole, no big deal. Sometimes, if they're really big, they'll hit the ground and they'll carve out a giant crater in this massive explosion. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the science and a little bit from my perspective about some of the things the elders have taught me about the culture. When I'm working in this area, it is very difficult because I'm not an expert in anything indigenous, even though I work in cultural astronomy, and a lot of that involves learning about indigenous knowledge. I think there's a lot of misconception around what those of us who work in this field actually do. So I'm not an expert in indigenous knowledge. I don't speak an indigenous language. I'm not an indigenous person. I didn't grow up in the community. I've, you know, no basis for any of that. What I spend most of my time doing is one of two things in general. It's working with the elders by invitation to bring together all of their knowledge, which can be utilized for educational purposes, for community resources or going back through the archive, which is filled with all kinds of problems in and of itself, and trying to correct as many of the misconceptions and factual errors as I can. I think I spend probably, I think I, I looked at it, about 40% of all my publications are going back in the archive and correcting all the mistakes that the early ethnographers made. Because the elders are explaining to them their star knowledge. And with the eyes of an astronomer, I can usually tell which objects they're talking about, which stars they're talking about, and what they mean. But a lot of the early ethnographers didn't have any training in astronomy, and they get stuff wrong. They conflate terminology, they get ideas wrong, they mix planets and stars, meteors and comets, they misidentify things. We have so many different cultures and stories and points of view, um, you know, on the universe and on the patterns that are in the sky. And they are subjective you know, according to where you're standing, but also from moment to moment. You know, it's not just the stars. And yes, it's the gaps in between um, and the shapes in between, the darker shapes that, that form stories and, you know, all of those um, sites of creation, Mimburi, all those things, that, you know, sites of constant motion and increase. Um, and these are reflected, you know, in the map of your country. But that star map and that pattern, you know, it's different... It, it, it shapes your camp, uh, earth camp, you know, because that's the creation event of that, that turnaround, that separation of, you know, something that was one and therefore nothing, you know, and when in multiples there was that, that separation um, of sky camp and earth camp. Um, and this, it's not a flat earth theory, you know, this idea that there's a like, you know, a ceiling or a dome or something like that, and that those things are fixed. Um, it's not that either, because you you do get, you know, from the old stories, this awareness, you know, that we are, um, you know, we, we are in a universe and, 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 you know, on something that's moving in the same way that those things are moving. There's that awareness, that planetary awareness as well, um, that's there. Uh, but at the same time, you have a strongly localized point of view because it's what's in the sky is creating the patterns. It's creating patterns that are um, uh, echoing and mirroring uh, patterns that occur on Earth. And there's that as above, so below thing going on. So you have these communications from Sky Camp. And it's not necessarily the heavenly bodies themselves, um, but it's the pattern and image that they're creating that creates a, a world of spirit that interacts with, you know, um, the, with this world, the tangible world down here. 
and there's so much and they're not that separate either because there's so much interaction so you know you could be singing up that uh star story sky story and and then but there might be some smoke from the fire that'll go across and that enters the song that enters the story in that moment you know that becomes part of that uh some night birds flying across or um and of course you know clouds but of course shooting stars you know um, these are it's it's constantly in motion there's a constant exchange of uh, energy and matter between the two worlds um, and sentient entities it's it's a, a communication so you have this ancestral communication you know between sky camp and where you might be standing in your subjective experience in that moment so there's a kind of a patterning it's um it's not the same as this idea of um, this idea of space, you know, as a mechanical thing or a, a place of dead things and, and, you know, wondering if there's any life out there or anything is because, you know, if in your worldview, everything's alive and everything is sentient, then, you know, you, you're looking up and seeing this dynamic self-organizing system that's patterned on the stories of your place. And it's showing you something specifically from your standpoint and your point of view in that moment where it's giving you that message and that pattern of the universe. But at the same time, you know that the people in the next language group over here or the next one over there or where you might travel for half a year to get to that ceremony <laughs> there, that that's a, that's a different one, a different story. You know, so truth in our way is not this empirical thing. You know, truth is um, an aggregate of many different stories. And the truth is in the diversity and in the the multiplicity in the the pluralism of of ideas and stories and viewpoints all at once you know it's in the spaces in between but it's more it's in the aggregate you know so there isn't that empirical idea and i guess it's important to get into that quite deeply first before you start looking at well what's an indigenous viewpoint of meteors or anything else uh, because they'll be different viewpoints depending on who's looking at it, but depending on the context of all the other signs. And that might include night birds. It might include the sound. Well, it always includes the sounds that accompany it. You know, are you hearing a boom in the distance? Are you hearing a rumbling or a growl? Are you hearing a whistle or a scream or a, are you hearing music? Are you hearing a beat? You know, it's, it's these things that we collectively, you know, we're sitting around at night and we need to all share our story of what we've perceived. And the truth of, of that is in the aggregate. Because colonization has been so devastating in, in Australia, it's fragmented a lot of the traditional knowledge. So different elders will have bits and pieces. Some places the elders have a lot of the knowledge. Some places they don't. I've been to communities they say we, we don't have hardly any of this stuff. And they rely on the archive, which is filled with all kinds of problems because it was written by non-Indigenous people. Um, who didn't understand the language or the concepts and had their own bias and motivation for doing what they were doing. So what I tend to do a lot of the times is go through the archive and pull all that stuff that I can, that has to be synthesized and analyzed. You know, I go and I interview the elders and the community members. So I get those fragments of knowledge from them. And then any physical sites that might relate to that, you know, and then I try to go through all of that together and try to synthesize all that. So it's constant consultation with the elders. The archive says this, I think they're wrong. You know, and the elders will come in and say, well, this part's wrong, this part's right. And we, we come out, we converge at the end of the day with something that the community's happy with, that we can then turn into books and educational materials and curricula and things like that. So as a non-Indigenous person, this is a lot of what I'm doing in this space. But I'm not going into this from a position of authority. I'm a professor and I know this, this, and that rubbish. I don't know shit. What I've been very privileged to learn about are some of the interesting ways that Aboriginal people across Australia understand meteors or these shooting stars. One of the common views is that they represent evil spirits or evil beings. I know this is kind of a simplification but they're seen as these long streaks across the sky, serpentine-like uh, creatures with long arms and claws uh, go by different names. One of the famous ones is Namorodo, a Namorador. It's seen as this evil being with long claws that steals the hearts out of children. And parents often warn their children not to look 
at meteors. Meteors also can represent the spirits of people who have passed away. Now, for those of you who are looking for a reference point, there's a fantastic series called Clever Man that came out on NITV a couple of years ago. And that actually features the Namorodo at the very beginning. You see it come out of the sky as a meteor and fall into the bay before coming out. So these traditions are widespread across the northern half of Australia. And there's many deeper levels of knowledge behind that. But its link with death, its link with evil spirits is fairly common across the country. The shooting star is always a something. So a something in our way is, um, is a communication, you know, from that other world. It's a, a communication in spirit. And a shooting star is always a something. You know, like a bird landing over there, sometimes that might be a something. But sometimes it's just a bloody bird, you know. <laughs> but a shooting star is always a something. And whether or not you, um, you know, you need to meet and discuss and look at all the signs and all of the context, but then what's happening in the community you know, before you decide, is that a death? Is that a birth? You know, is it another uh, kind of signal? Is it an entity, um, you know, traveling between the worlds? And then where is that? What's the direction of that? What's the color of that? Uh, is it good or bad? You know, what's happening? Because we do have, you know, these entities that travel between the worlds and always have now, one of the things I've been very happy to learn about and very privileged to learn about in the Torres Strait is their idea about something we call fireballs. These are the really bright meteors that come across the sky. In the eastern Torres Strait with the Mary and Mir people, the elders have taught me that this is called a Mayer. A Mayer represents the spirit of someone who has recently passed away. When that person is about to die, their spirit is taken to the top of the tallest palm tree. It set a light like a rocket and shoots across the sky to Beg, the island of the dead, where it stays for three days before coming back to its home. So the elders like Uncle Sigar Passi, Uncle Alo Topham, Uncle Ron Day, I've learned quite a bit from these elders. And they've taught me that the Mayer has special significance, not just because it represents somebody who's passed away, but because every element, every property of that fireball, of that mire, tells you something about that person. The brightness can tell you about how important they were in the community. The trajectory of the fireball tells you where they're from, where's their home. If the fireball breaks apart and leaves little fragments like we see here, those are called queer queer. Those fragments, those sparks that fall down, tell you that that person has left behind a large family. And when they have reached Beg, the island of the dead, you hear the doom, the explosion, that tells you that person has reached their destination. In Western scientific terms, this is a fireball coming through the atmosphere. The pressure breaks it apart into these little fragments. And that boom, that dooming sound, that is the sound of it exploding in the atmosphere. And the elders have taught me they've experienced this themselves and how it links closely with people passing away. So it's, it's a really important, sacred, piece of knowledge that's been passed on that they talk about. This tradition is also encapsulated in song and dance. The elders have played and sung Meyer songs. There's actually two different Meyer songs. We're going to play one that was recorded in 1960s. Another version of this song has been recently recorded by Werner Herzog and Clive Oppenheimer for the upcoming film, Fireball. We filmed a segment on Mare with the community. And we had four fellas, four dancers who came up and had just learned the dance that day. This dance had not been performed on Mare, where the island, you know, the origin of the story of the song from this island hadn't been performed in 20 or 30 years. So the elders got together 
they taught the dancers this song and they filmed it at sunset on the island of Mare. It was really a truly beautiful experience to sit back and to see this. You can even see here the filmmakers who were walking around while the community sang the song using the warp and the limit. The warp is an hourglass shaped drum made out of a hollow tree log. And the drum head is usually made of goanna skin with clumps of wax on it to help the timbre and the tone. The limit is a hollow piece of bamboo that you clack with sticks. So I've got a small clip I'd like to play for you. This is just part of the background image of which you can see in the larger film when it comes out. So keep an eye out for that film, which will hopefully be released sometime this year. Of course, COVID-19 has sort of pushed that back a bit, but it'll still be very exciting to see that. Um, that film talks about meteors and fireballs from different cultures all around the world. And there will be another example um, in that film from Australia that we'll talk about in just a little bit. Now, sometimes these fireballs explode in the atmosphere and they can create these massive shock waves and they can even cause death and destruction. The most famous example of this occurred in Tunguska in Siberia, where this bolide, this fireball came down from the sky and exploded, flattening over 2,000 square kilometers of taiga forest. It sent a shock wave that went around the earth twice and put so much heat and light into the atmosphere that people in London could read a newspaper at midnight. It took 19 years before any scientist went out to the site. And even after almost 20 years passing, you could see thousands of trees all laying down, flattened by this massive air burst. At the time, it wasn't clear what had really caused this. And this led to a whole world of speculation, ranging from ideas about a comet or an asteroid falling and exploding to alien spacecraft and mini black holes and time warps coming through. In the last 10 years, scientists have proven that it was actually a small asteroid that came into the atmosphere. And it was coming fast enough and hard enough, it created enough pressure that it simply exploded in the atmosphere. 
And much of those, those little tiny fragments actually were embedded in some of those trees. You can actually see the little fragments of the meteorites embedded in the trees that are laying down. Even a hundred years later, you can see some of these amazing uh, trees lying down after all that time. Now the Evenki people, who were the indigenous people of the area, have traditions about this. They talked about how a thunder god uh, was angry and in retribution created this giant explosion. So this is recorded in indigenous traditions in central Siberia. We find traditions about these kinds of things happening all around the world. So we're standing in this place and we're looking up and we're seeing one patterning and one set of stories. And from moment to moment that will change and it'll reflect change in the landscape. Because sky camp's always moving. Earth camp is also always moving. And as the old fellows say, if you don't move with country, then country will move you. The land will move you. <laughs> so, you know, having these sedentary settlements and all these things is, um, it kind of makes Armageddon's happen. You know, uh, Armageddon's aren't an end to things at all. You know, that's just country moving and you're supposed to be moving with it. I guess if you lose the ability to move, then these, um, these become really ap apocalyptic and, you know, uh, destructive for environments and for people. And we have these warnings in all our stories. And when I say us, I mean people, you know. Um, so you have the Tower of Babel, you know, where people were, were setting up, you know, a sedentary civilization and a, a monoculture where everybody was speaking one language and all that sort of thing. And you had that apocalyptic destruction happen. And you see the same thing here all over. Um, and w one really good example is that um, Goanna story from Barkinchi, um, mob where, where at, at, at one stage in history, you know, mm, tens of thousands of years ago, everybody thought it was a good idea because there was such abundance in this one place at, at that time that it might be good just to, um, well, we've, we've come for, together for s ceremony, lots of different language groups. Dozens of language groups have all come together, all different dialects, all different tribes, mobs, clans have all come together. And then it's so abundant here, let's just stop here. So they sat and they stayed in one place. And in time, they all started speaking one language. And they forgot their own languages. So they lost their diversity. And when they lost their diversity of worldviews and, and the different star maps from being in the different places and, um, you know, responding and moving with country and moving with sky... Um, well, that went the wrong way because then they couldn't move when the inevitable disaster came, which is always that punishment for, you know, trying to deny time and deny place and motion, the motion of celestial bodies, including the one that we're on. And so, of course, there was a big meteor strike there and it was like a nuclear blast and it, it killed most of the people. Um, and of course, the story goes that it, it burned different patterns into different species of goannas. And of course, and then from one goanna to the next, even if they're the same species with similar patterning, it's like a fingerprint. So there's that, ah, there's that diversity there, you know? It's different patterning and we need those different patterns and we need all those diverse points of view and we need all those different languages and we need to be moving with the seasons around our, you know, our estates on this country um, and we need to be adapting and evolving and our language changes over time as the land changes and it shapes our language and all these things are signaled to us you know from this sky camp because there is that mirroring that patterning that's happening between and that constant exchange and even interventions <laughs> from these heavenly bodies you know and those stories might be interpreted in a different way so if you were all the way over in Wiradjuri country, you still would have seen that meteor, but then you might, that might be a different thing. And Gamilaroi might have been watching that and go, oh, that's Huawei coming down there, you know, and that would be signaling something else to them, you know, but it's all that same spirit. Sometimes these objects will actually hit the ground and we have a whole range of meteorite impact craters all around Australia. In fact, there's about 30, I believe, 30, 35 confirmed craters in Australia. Some of them ranging in size from no more than 25 meters wide, like Dalgaranga, to ranging in over 100 kilometers wide, like Ackerman. 
Some of them are very young, which we're going to speak about. Some of them are incredibly old, billions of years old. Some of them are just a few thousand years old. You have a whole range across Australia. And what's interesting is some of these craters are discussed in Aboriginal traditions. Before we talk about that, let's look a little bit about the science behind that. How do we know what a crater looks like? What are different types of craters? Now, in general, you have two general types of craters. You have simple craters and complex craters. Simple craters on the Earth are less than about 1.4 kilometers wide. They're created from smaller impactors. When they hit, they make this beautiful bowl-shaped crater. I think this is what most of us think of when we think of a meteorite crater. But you'll get some really big ones. I mean, it's more of a, a, an actual asteroid, a really large object that comes down and hits. It creates what's called a complex crater. And it's this weird energy conservation in the Earth that causes the center to sort of rebound. And you get a flatter crater. It's not so deep as a simple crater, but it's more shallow. It's more spread out. And you get this weird central up peak in the middle of it, this sort of lift in the middle. On the image, we can see two examples that are very clear. They're from the moon. There's no trees or debris around. It makes it a lot easier to see. But on the Earth, you get lots of examples of both of these. In Australia, there are aboriginal traditions about both of these. The first one we're going to talk about is a place called Henbury. From the scientific perspective, Henbury was formed about four and a half thousand years ago, so fairly recently on the grand scheme of things, four and a half thousand years, when a small object made of nickel and iron came blasting into the atmosphere. As it did, it broke apart, just like those fireballs we looked at earlier. When it hit the ground, it created a whole series of craters, some ranging from about 10 meters wide to over 180 meters wide. Henbury features about 15 craters spread out over a square kilometer. This is about 120, 130 kilometers south of Alice Springs in the Central Desert. And it's right on the border of Aranda and Lurichia country. If you actually go out to Henbury, which is a, a national, it's a public park, you can see these craters. You can walk around and experience what it must have been like to see, to witness something like this. I mean, if you'd have been on site, you would have been vaporized, you're toast. But had you been far enough away, you would have seen this massive fireball come blazing down, hit the ground, the land would have caught on fire, it blasted debris uh, you know, several kilometers around, and at the end of it all, of all the fire and destruction, is these giant metallic clumps of nickel and iron scattered all over the place. Today, you can't see very many of those fragments at all. Those are the meteorites that are left over. The reason you can't see many of them is everybody's gone out and picked the place dry. There's hardly anything around. It's really unfortunate. I really advocate against removing meteorites from places like this, because this is cultural heritage. It's scientific heritage. It should be left in situ. It should be left where it is. But unfortunately, the site's been picked almost completely dry, but you can still see these massive craters. And these craters give you some kind of indication. You take a rock and throw it in the ground and see the little hole it makes. You think about how big this impactor was how fast it was traveling, and how hot and devastating the whole area must have been after this incredible impact. So you can see a bit of a, a black and white map here that shows you some of the layout, a bit of a drawing where this is. And on the bottom edge there, there's a, a small little mountain range called the Bacon Range. And the craters actually come up into that as well. So it's a really, truly amazing site. I've been there a couple of times. It's something that when you see it and experience it, it's, it's almost a spiritual experience. It really is. But we've also learned that there are aboriginal traditions about it. And initially, when scientists first went out to the area, when they'd ask aboriginal people about it, the aboriginal people said, oh, we don't know anything about that. No, nope, no traditions. So the early scientists said, oh, well, there's no aboriginal stories about this. They weren't interested in that. The reality is people were interested in that, but there was a reason that they didn't talk about it. It was because it was a sorry place, that's what I've learned. It was a place of fire and destruction. And some elders talked about how it was a place where fire devil ran down from the sun. It set the land on fire, created all these big holes, and killed everybody. And the reason for that is people were disobeying traditional law, and it was sent down as punishment from the sky. And even though in some of these craters water would collect whenever it would rain, the people were forbidden from going in and collecting water because they feared that the fire devil would fill the craters with iron again. Now, I saw this in some old newspaper clippings, and I thought, well, this is remarkable. There clearly are traditions about this. And I saw the, the words were written in an Aboriginal language. I didn't understand what it was, 
but I recognized that it came from near the border of Aranda and Luritchik country. So I fortunately had two dictionaries, and I began looking at them and realizing that those two languages, even though they're adjacent to each other, are completely different. A list of words in Aranda looks nothing like the list of words in Luritchik. But when I began looking at the, the language, it was very clear it was Luritchik. And the elders talked about this as an event that's in recorded memory. It's in oral tradition. This has been passed down for over 4,000 years. It's still vivid. It's still there. It's still present. Another site that I've been honored to learn about is a place called Norla. Western science calls it Goss's Bluff. It, in Western science terms, is a gigantic asteroid impact crater. This thing is enormous. It's over 20 kilometers wide, the entire crater. Um, it was formed by a small, uh, it's actually a comet, I believe it was a comet, it's very low density, formed by a low density object, a comet, 142 million years ago, which impacted the ground, created this giant complex crater, whereas the Henbury were simple craters. This is a giant complex crater. When it occurred 142 million years ago, the land was two kilometers higher than it is now. It's because it's eroded down all that time that what we see now is this beautiful ring-shaped mountain range. This is part of the central uplift in the middle of that crater. And if you've ever been to the site, which you can access, it is also an amazing spiritual place. There's a great deal of Aboriginal knowledge and traditions behind that. I'm not going to speak about all of that because it also relates to sorry business. But the elders do tell us their traditional story about how it formed. And it actually created life. This is Auntie Mavis Malbunka. She's a Western Aranda uh, custodian of Norla, of the site. And she tells us that in the dreaming, there were a group of eight women who took the form of stars. They were dancing a corroboree in the Milky Way. One of the women, who was carrying a baby, put the baby in a wooden basket called a kulaman, or a turna, and set the baby on the edge of the Milky Way. As the women danced the corroboree, they caused the Milky Way to vibrate and the baby fell out of the Milky Way. As it came falling down to the earth as a shooting star, it hit the ground and the turn of fell on top. The impact of the baby hitting down drove all the rocks upwards around it. That's why we see this ring-shaped mountain range. This is where the baby, the star baby, fell from the sky. The baby's parents, the morning star and the evening star, take turns looking for their lost child today. Aboriginal Parents tell their children not to look at the morning star or the evening star because they might mistake the child as their lost baby and take them away. I was very excited to learn about this site, um, not just from what I've read in the literature, but there are two other ways. One are, is an amazing series of films called Baby Falling Norla by Warwick Thornton. He's a famous movie director who did Samson and Delilah and, and a whole long list of films. But early on, he did this film, and he featured Auntie Mavis speaking in Aranda language. So you actually learn this directly from the elders. I was also very fortunate five years ago to be involved in the filming of a segment of the documentary with National Geographic called The Story of God with Morgan Freeman. And I was there with Warren Williams. Warren Williams is a nephew of Auntie Mavis, and he's one of the traditional custodians of the site. So while we're filming the documentary, he was teaching me some more of the traditions behind this place. And he taught me that if you look up in the Milky Way, you can see this arch of stars, a sort of U-shape of stars. And that represents the Turna, the Kulman, falling out of the Milky Way. In Western science, we call that Corona Australis, the southern crown. And you can see it tilted out of the Milky Way, slightly at an angle. Um, it was a really amazing experience to be out there with him and, and learn from him about the importance of that site, about how it links to our traditions and creation, and about the spiritual aspects of that. So if you want to see that, it's on episode four of The Story of God with Morgan Freeman of season one. Uh, it was the first time I've ever seen a dot painting animation of an impact crater before. It was really exciting. So with a lot of those uh, song lines around the Seven Sisters, you know, they're of course related to then the Orion constellation. And I've got that one here. And then uh, the Seven Sisters here. Um, I mean, you can't really see that because of the way I've done it in a really dark ochre. It, um, you can't see it until you put it underwater and then it shines out. But yeah, this one was made while walking and being, and being guided along a lot of song lines. 
uh, particularly around the Seven Sisters, but a lot of other songlines coming out from that, um, going uh, like right across the continent. But uh, a lot of it was in Western Australia. So um, there were, you know, um, Seven Sisters places there uh, that I went to, but then the songlines that I walked along as well. Um, and I was given about, I don't know, maybe 12, 13 years ago, um, I was given a, a little, they call them tektites, you know, yeah, one of those little shooting stars um, from a, a place along the end of one of those uh, Seven Sisters song lines. It was at the place where, the, where they came to earth. Um, so somebody gave me that to carry around. <laughs> because they knew I was going back east and you know I think they wanted to facilitate some kind of communication across with uh, other mobs or whatever um, so I, I spent I've spent the last decade carrying that around um, in the last five years it's it appears and disappears so it was actually set into that boomerang there I've just got some native beeswax there filling that space where it goes sometimes it's back there and then it's gone and then it'll be, uh, I'll be looking in my bag and it'll be there. And I'll be, oh, you're back again. Uh, <laughs> so it kind of just does its own work going around. Um, you know, they kind of wink in and out of existence. Um, and I guess there's a lot of work that people do. I'm, I'm not one of those adepts or anything. It's, um, you know, I, I think that's something that an adept person is doing to me rather than something I'm, um, you know, manipulating or doing for myself. Um, yeah, it's, it's been gone for two years now, but it's been gone for two years before and popped back up. So you never know. So, so some of these things occur in cycles. So that, um, you know, that in some places that, that, that sister's known to come down and return uh, and even appear there in that constellation again in, in different cycles. Um, you know, there's things going on with Venus and, and all kinds of things in different places there. But like I said, you'll find that story is different in, in different places. And that's because the pattern's different, you know, from where you're standing. Um, and I, I think this is really important because as human beings, like, it, it is good to have a, a view of the cosmos. And, um, you know, it, every model... As we know about modeling, so in science, we know that every model, every theory is wrong. This is a true, we, we know this to be true. Every model and every theory is wrong, but they're all useful in some contexts. <laughs> and I guess this is um, the basis of indigenous philosophy. It's, it's embracing all these models and applying them where they're useful. So, you know, your local story is useful locally. You know, but it's also good to share that because you need all those views. So those uh, Barkanchi, that you know, it was a happy ending to the story because the um, the survivors split back into those groups and recovered their languages. So, of course, language recovery is possible. We can see historically from that, and um, yeah, move with the landscape again, and and you know, and rebuilt an amazing you know diverse set of cultures and stories. Um, you know, out from that, from that incident. And of course, a wonderful story to share with everybody else. Another place in Australia that links closely with science and indigenous culture is Wolf Creek Crater or Gondamalal in the traditions. A uh, Wolf Creek Crater, of course, made very famous by the horror movie series, is actually the second largest rimmed meteorite crater in the world that has meteorites associated with it. So it's, it's one of the few places in the world where you can see something this big. It's almost a full kilometer in diameter. It's about 900, 950 meters in diameter. And when it formed has been a topic of contention for decades. Um, back about 1990, the famous uh, asteroid meteorite hunter and scientist Eugene Shoemaker uh, did a study and thought that it was on the order of somewhere within the last 300,000 years. So it could be very old. But it wasn't until early last year, in 2019, that a team of scientists used a whole different number of techniques to try to understand how old this crater is. They came up with a few different ages, but it turns out it's much younger. I think the agreement is about 120,000 years old, but some of the dating techniques showed even a few tens of thousands of years old. Quite young, quite an interesting site. 
beautiful, well-preserved out in the desert. Now, the Aboriginal people of the area, the Jaru people, have a whole number of traditions about it, and they're not all the same. Some of them are quite different. Some of them talk about where this is where a rainbow serpent came out of the ground and went up into the sky. Some of them talk about how a rainbow serpent went into the ground and created creeks and rivers underneath the ground that are interconnected. And some of them talk about how this object fell from the sky. The morning star came too close to the moon and it fell out of the sky as the rainbow serpent hit the ground and created this massive structure we see today. So this is a painting by the late Aboriginal artist Spieler Sturt in 2003, who described this very story, this element of his story. So some of the traditions talk about it forming from the star that fell out of the sky, and some talk about it in different terms. What it tells us is there's not always exactly one clear-cut, black and white version of traditions. There are multiple traditions, even about the same site, even about the same stars in the sky. There's a multitude of meanings, and multiple layers behind that. It's really remarkable when we're looking at these traditions about these sites, whether they're stars or a crater or a meteor or whatever. From Western science, we tend to think of everything's in black and white. There's a correct version, and there are everything else is incorrect, and that's it. So there can only be one definitive boundary to a constellation. We actually measure it exactly carefully, very well defined. If it's, you know, if it's a scientific explanation about how a meteor forms, this is how it is. Here's the theory behind it, here are the observations. There are no other views. The culture is taken out of that, even though it exists within a cultural framework, because we scientists, we're humans. How we get funding, how we go about doing it, where we publish, how we present it, all of that is culturally defined and culturally guided. But we try to take the culture out of it. And that creates a bit of a problem. You know, it, it, it helps us understand certain questions we're trying to ask. Now, what limited things I have learned about indigenous knowledge is it doesn't work that way. That's tied in inextricably with culture. That the meaning and agency behind that are linked in. It's multifaceted, multi-layered. Everything isn't black and white. How do these things work together? And you can have one object, it can be a star, that can have multiple meanings. There's, there's five or six different names for a star sometimes, depending on where it is, what part of the narrative it's describing, what part of the song line it's attached to, it can have a multitude of meanings. That can be within the same community. And of course, if you have something that's across different communities, some of them may have very similar views, some of them may have very different views. One of the elders from the area worked with a colleague of mine named John Goldsmith. John Goldsmith did his PhD at Curtin University in Perth on indigenous knowledge and indigenous astronomy, documenting it in close collaboration with the elders. And one of the things he focused on was Gondomal, was Wolf Creek, and working with the elders to interview them to preserve knowledge about the site in perpetuity. Jaru elder Stan Brumby told about John about the story of Gondomal and talked about how that story came from the sky. This is another one of the segments in the upcoming film Fireball by Werner Herzog and Clive Oppenheimer. So it'll be a great opportunity to see that film and see both of these segments in there. One talking about the fireball from the Mayer and the Torres Strait, and one talking about the impact crater Gondomalal from Jaru traditions in Western Australia. Even within the Jaru community, there are different versions of the story because the stories can be linked to families. It's not like there's gonna only be one story tied to a community and that's all. Each family, each person, each knowledge custodian, from what I understand, can have their own version of this. And within that tradition are rules about social structure. There are rules about behaviors. It's the law. The Lord can tell you about the science. So when I talk about indigenous science, I'm just pulling out a very thin layer of that. They wouldn't even call it science. It's something we think about in a Western framework. And that's something we're looking more into. But there's just these multiple interlinked ways of understanding the world and the patterns about how you recognize it and how it works and how it functions. It's so complex. I mean, some days I'm learning about this stuff. I just feel like I'm, I'm in the middle of the Pacific Ocean trying to swim with, uh, you know, with an anchor tied around me because I just, I'm so outside that frame of, of knowledge and understanding. I'm trying to, to see how it works. And I don't think most of the public has any clue of how complicated, how detailed, how complex and how rich this is. So the final thing I'd like to talk about tonight is Something I've, I'm just now publishing a paper on, it's, it's quite interesting, about the most famous meteorite crater in the world, called Meteor Crater, or Behringer Crater, in Arizona, in the United States, where I'm from. 
I've never seen it, I've always wanted to, I can't wait to get out there and have a look at it myself. It is the largest meteorite crater in the world that has meteorite fragments associated with it. It goes by a whole number of different names. Canyon Diablo or Devil's Canyon was a famous uh, name for it because there's a canyon nearby with that name. Now, the Hopi and the Navajo people have long-standing traditions about this. It was even used as a sacred site. There are elements of, of cliff dwellings in it that go back several hundred or several thousand years. But in scientific terms, it's only understood fairly recently what it is. You know, 120 years ago, the idea of objects falling out of the sky and hitting the ground and creating impact craters just wasn't well accepted by Western science. But indigenous cultures around the world had long known about this already. It's from the traditions that we learn more and more about these things. Now, Behringer Crater is quite unique because the people talked about, the Navajo and the Hopi talked about how this was a sacred site. And anybody who disturbed this site was going to face punishment, face ruin, and maybe even face death. But at the time, back about you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, a mining magnate named Daniel Behringer became very interested in the site. He had learned about it through some colleagues. And he was convinced at the time that this formed from a meteorite impact. Other people had thought that it was formed from a volcanic eruption. Despite the fact there were meteorite fragments all around the area, some distance away, there were also volcanic fields with volcanic craters. He believed that it did form from a meteorite impact. He also believed that the meteorite that formed it was buried underneath the bottom and contained a wealth of minerals that could be used to make an absolute fortune. So he began sort of working with colleagues and, and getting the funds together for this. And around that time, this story came out that the Navajo and the Hopi people of the area had traditions about a fiery object coming out of the sky and hitting the ground and creating this big hole. And that was used to help drum up financial interest, investors in the site. Who told the story? Don't exactly know. Who was the first person to mention that? Don't know. But we know around that time it began taking off. It took 20 years of drilling, of investment, and nothing came out of that crater bottom. An astronomer, 20 odd years later, did some calculations and found out that almost all of the impactor vaporized on impact, and only some scattered fragments survived around the area. Daniel Berenger was so hit by this he had invested millions and 20 years of his life. He had a heart attack and died. We found out later on, it was about the 1920s, from a Navajo man named Black Hawk Wing that there are Native American stories about this site, but it talked about how it formed from a thunderbolt, not from an object falling out of the sky. So it seems the traditions were slightly turned around to help promote this idea. But the people were right. You desecrate that sacred site, it does have an impact and it led to financial ruin and death. There is, you know, a, a diversity of stories. And so those people getting together and exchanging those stories after, you know, there's not one person trying to go, no, this is the truth. No, this is the truth. Debate, 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 fake news, uh, putting it down. This is the winner. This is where we're going. It's all of those views and the aggregate in the aggregate of that, that the, the truth emerges, you know, um, as what you need, the model that you need in each time and place. You need to move with country. You need to pay attention to the heavens as well as the earth. And there is constant communication between the worlds. There is an exchange of matter. And these are complex, dynamic, self-organizing systems uh, that are constantly interacting with each other. Um, and as self-organizing systems, they, they do have an inherent intelligence and um, you know, so for a culture where you might see that a rock is a sentient uh, thing that carries knowledge inherently and has pattern, has knowledge, um, then you know that every rock up there uh, has that knowledge. Is there intelligent life in the universe? Well, the universe is intelligent life. And um, yeah, when we see these meteors, they, they, are, they are that intelligence communicating with us. So it's important that we look at these traditions, that we look at the science, and we bring those two worlds together. Because there's so many ways that these can benefit each other. There's so many ways that we can find innovation. There's so many ways that we can look at these ancient traditions to help us understand the process 
of how these things form, to understand how long ago they formed, and to help us understand how long a world tradition lasts. Because as indigenous people have been telling us, these traditions can last very long periods of time. And we can see that even lasting thousands of years. I think one of the key points we want people to understand is that Western science is fairly young. These indigenous knowledge systems are extremely old that there is a lot that we can learn if we listen to the elders. You know, our science can be guided by these traditional knowledges very, very well. There's a lot we can learn. We can also learn a lot of things if we come together. So we can find new impact crater sites if we work with the traditional custodians. We can learn from them to find where meteors have hit, meteorites have hit the ground, um, about how we understand different phenomena, like the noise meteors make, you know, meteors make. Not very well understood, but the traditions talk about that. So if we work together, there's a whole lot that we can accomplish. And instead of placing indigenous knowledge down here and Western science up there, we need to see them at least on equal footing. You know, if not indigenous knowledge being much older and much more complex as being much more informative. We need to see that on that level and realize that indigenous knowledges and Western science can learn a lot if we work together.